Så ni lagt den af. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much in joining, for joining us at the weekly Greater Manchester briefing. Again, we're going to organise the briefing in two parts today. Uh, myself and Sir Richard Lees will take you through uh, the latest uh, data and obviously the uh, ongoing uh, decision about the, uh, the tier uh, situation. And then in part two, uh, we will have an update on policing, including our work in responding to the HMIC report. So we will separate it in, in that way. We'll be joined by um, Deputy Mayor Baroness Beverly Hughes and Deputy Chief Constable uh, Ian Pilling in the second half. So we will, um, if you could think about your questions uh, relevant to those two parts, but we'll start with, with health and I'll hand over straight to Sir Richard. Uh, thanks, Andy. Good afternoon, everybody. And I think the first slide is up already, which looks at the seven day rate of positive cases per 100,000 population. Uh, if you look at the, the very top line, uh, you will see that the overall number has gone down again, uh, but the rate of decrease has slowed. And you will see, I think it's three, possibly four uh, districts where the uh, number of uh, cases per 100,000 population has gone up. Certainly one of the factors around this and uh, partially correcting what I said last week is that uh, lateral flow tests are now included. Uh, that that does mean a, a relatively small increase uh, overall for Greater Manchester. That would account for a 2% uh, in, increase, but in Manchester and Salford and Trafford, it's slightly bigger because that's where students live, and this now includes the student test uh, re results. And relatively small numbers can may make a difference. So the overall trend continues to be uh, down, and that's obviously very, very welcome. If we move to the next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the colour chart which shows age profile of uh, people testing uh, positive. Uh, I think the two important things around this is that uh, the over 65s continues to be going uh, largely in the right direction and that's really, really important uh, because those are the people who are most likely to be hospitalised. Uh, the most resistant uh, area overall is really the 30 to 44 year olds. And whilst that's an area of concern around transmission, so we're saying that this is an age group that by and large, most people do not get seriously ill, that there will be exceptions to that. And most people who become ill in this age group do not get to hospitalised. So whilst it's a concern around transmission, it is not a direct concern in terms of uh, pressure on hospitals. Actually, for the median age of people in COVID wards in hospitals is uh, high 70s, not 30 to 44. Now, uh, if we move on. This is the uh, testing per 100,000 population. Uh, again, the, f the number of tests has gone up and that's a result of uh, lateral flow testing being in included. It's only about a 10% uh, of the tests being done on lateral flow, but it's beginning to have an impact. Uh, unlike the positive cases per 100,000 though, that on this particular chart, it has the opposite impact is that bringing lateral flow tests in, most of which um, don't prove positive are bringing the positivity rate down. The positivity rate continues to improve. Next slide, please. Uh, that's going backwards. Yes, uh, OK. Uh, care homes. Um, we talked a lot about care homes last week and particularly about the arrangements we're putting in place for testing to allow uh, visits. And I think those, those arrangements are now uh, going into practice. And you will see that in terms of the care home residents with confirmed COVID-19 symptoms, it's gone down for the uh, third week on the uh, on, on the trot and is now actually the lowest you can see on that chart. So certainly the lowest it's been since probably the beginning of November, end of October. Next one. Uh, hospitals. And 
uh, you see that admissions to hospitals for COVID-19 has continued to go down. Uh, say that actually on, uh, on admissions, uh, non-COVID admissions now outnumber COVID admissions around about three or four to, uh, to one. Uh, whilst that's positive, the increase in uh, inpatient diagnosis for COVID-19 uh, isn't quite so positive. There has been an increase of people already in hospital being uh, diagnosed with COVID-19. That appears to be a national problem and I know that the, the hospital sector is taking uh, quite determined action to uh, do everything they can to bring that under control. Uh, better news is uh, ICU beds where again intensive care beds where again we see the occupancy has continued uh, to go down. We are now in a position across Greater Manchester where uh, there are more non-COVID patients in ICU than there are COVID patients. That's the first time that's been the case for a number of weeks. And um, we are maintaining some of the surge capacity, some of the uh, extra capacity that was put in, not actually being used at the moment, being be, being kept in so that we do have a buffer if there is uh, a turn up in cases. And I'll say a little bit more about that before before I uh, uh, finish. Uh, the number of COVID occupied beds overall has remained relatively stable. And um, that again is a factor that, that we've talked about previously, is that the length of stay in hospital is significantly longer, largely as a result of survival rates being a, a lot, lot, uh, a lot, lot better. So th uh, that explains why uh, that by and large in the, the general beds, the number has re remained fairly stable, even though admissions are going down. If we move on. Uh, Right, this is a tiering question uh, really on, on this particular side. Uh, if you look at Greater Manchester's numbers now and compare them with London and uh, Liverpool City Region at the time of the tiering decision, you will see that Greater Manchester's numbers now are significantly better than either London's or Liverpool's. And although uh, London's position has deteriorated, uh, Liverpool, which uh, I think I've indicated before, is quite often on a trajectory a couple of weeks ahead of Greater Manchester, has continued to uh, continue to improve. And clearly we won't know the decision until tomorrow, but if you look simply at those figures, if you look at what we said about what's happening within our hospitals and that we are not under the same pressure as we were a month ago, the logic of that uh, would suggest that Greater Manchester should be moved to uh, Tier 2. Um, something Andy might want to comment on, even if the entirety of Greater Manchester isn't moved to uh, Tier 2, the, a large chunk of Greater Manchester certainly should be moved to uh, uh, Tier 2. The, it's probably worth on the, but well, I'll talk about Christmas when we get to the last slide actually. So if we move to the, uh, the next one. We didn't use the slide last week, but I think it's worth putting in uh, this week because of regional comparisons. And you will see that London up 90%, South East up 63%, East of England up 92%, uh, North West continues to go down by 11%, and Greater Manchester going down at a faster rate than that of minus 20%. Uh, there is a real concern that because of uh, London and the South East, we've seen uh, that quite often government's decisions have been, I would say, distorted by what's happening in London and, and the South East and Greater Manchester and the North in general have suffered as a consequence, very much hoping that that's not going to happen uh, today and tomorrow when announcements are made and that we will be treated fairly on the, uh, uh, on, on the numbers. And let's move on. Uh, this is the last slide. It is about keeping safe for Christmas and clearly this has been in the news uh, a lot and uh, I think a, a large number of people have been commenting about whether we should have the pro proposed relaxations for uh, Christmas and indeed if we are, how, whether five days is too long uh, or not. And uh, I think government's pretty much confirmed that they're not going to change uh, the restrictions. 
And what we want to do is that whatever the situation is to keep giving very clear, simple uh, messages. And these are the messages we're going to be giving. Keep the number of people you're seeing to a, a minimum. Although I think I might add on that we don't want people to be alone at Christmas uh, e either. Uh, but to make sure that they're sensible, responsible, wash your hands regularly, socially distance, wear a face covering when uh, uh, necessary. And uh, if your bubble is visiting your home, it's to make sure you've got hand sanitizer, you're wiping touch points and keeping rooms well ventilated. I know there's not a lot of enthusiasm for opening windows in December, but it's really important that uh, that the ventilation element is, is there. And that's, I think, the, the big message we want to deliver to people, whether we're in tier two, tier three, whether it's Christmas or not Christmas, is to continue to behave in a safe, responsible uh, way, because that's ultimately the way that we get this under control. Although, actually, I suppose ultimately uh, we, there are a few other things in play at the moment. Vaccinations are now taking place over uh, the entirety of Greater Manchester. We're clearly not up to uh, full capacity as, as yet, but uh, uh, there are lots of vaccinations taking place. I think the really good news about those, those vaccinations is that uh, people are turning up, that the, uh, the, all the appointments are being kept, uh, that uh, we are using all the vaccines that we've got. Uh, indeed, there are uh, people who are not in the priority order yet who are uh, were desperate to get the vaccines. And I think that's really, really positive sign that people are, when they've got the opportunity, to prepare to take the action to keep themselves safe and obviously through that to keep other people safe uh, as well. And I, I guess that that's probably the final message. Uh, this is not just about keeping ourselves safe, it's about keeping other people safe as well. That's what that responsibility is all about. I'll finish there, Andy. Thanks very much uh, indeed, uh, Richard. Uh, so just to, to add, um, as, as Richard was saying, we're uh, expecting decisions to be made later, possibly announced uh, tomorrow. The evidence is pretty good, we would say, from our point of view. Progress has clearly been made uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks and Greater Manchester is in a stronger position as a whole um, compared to London and Liverpool, as, as Sir Richard said. But of course, the context has changed a little with the um, rising cases in other parts of the country and the debate about, about Christmas. And obviously the government uh, may want to err on the side of caution. Um, so what I would say is, if the government does not want to put Greater Manchester as a whole in tier two, uh, particularly given the fact that a couple of our boroughs are above uh, national average or, or close to it, we, we do still believe there is a very strong case for a substantial part of the city region uh, to be placed in tier two. And we would ask the government to give regard to the fact that we have been under restrictions now for uh, four and a half months. That would mean five months by the next uh, review period. And given that the review late December is unlikely to be uh, a major review, it would mean businesses still shut to the middle of middle of January. And particularly given our cases are where they are, uh, we would say that that would be to damage our economy uh, unnecessarily. And we do ask the government uh, to consider carefully those arguments uh, be, before making their decision. There is the question of cities more generally in, in tier three and the closure of regulated hospitality uh, through this uh, period, particularly the new year uh, period. We uh, believe there is a real risk of more gatherings in the home if hospitality, particularly in cities, is to be closed uh, over that uh, period. And that might risk even greater spread uh, of the virus. And that has to be uh, taken into account in any decisions that are uh, being made. Uh, where I would agree with the Mayor of London and the Mayor of the West Midlands uh, is that the financial support on offer still is not uh, good enough. And these are points that have been made by the hospitality industry and the British Beer and Pub Association. Uh, the grant regime is not the same as it was earlier this year. Uh, if we go into a, uh, hopefully we won't, but if we do go into uh, winter uh, in a tier three position to mid-January, uh, it is clear to us that many of our pubs and restaurants will not survive. Uh, and if that is the government's decision, it has to come 
uh, with more uh, financial support, both for those businesses, but also uh, for the supply chain and for our councils uh, through the um, uh, additional uh, grants that is provided. So that is where we are at the moment. We're calling for the government to make evidence-based decisions, give Greater Manchester the same consideration that was given to other parts of the country at the original tiering uh, decisions. If that leads to a, 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 a differential position in parts of Greater Manchester, we would understand why the government might come to those conclusions. But we do repeat the case uh, for releasing a significant part of Greater Manchester from, from, from the restrictions that have caused a lot of damage to people's lives and businesses. So I will leave it there, Jimmy, and we will hand back to you to take us through the questions. Thank you. We have a, a couple to kick off, but um, for colleagues from the media on the call, this is the opportunity to ask Sir Richard and Andy health related questions. The first uh, is on testing and perhaps to start with Richard and, and then Andy, and it's from Andy Bounds at the Financial Times. Uh, Richard, are lateral flow tests worth the money? They're unreliable. Holden is allowing visits to care homes, but only with a PCR test three days before, as well as lateral flow on the day. And you still have to wear PPE, etc. Okay. So that question to Richard and then Andy. Well, I apologise to everybody else, but uh, Andy, this is something that we did uh, address last week. Um, I, th I think we've been criticised by the Secretary of State for Health uh, in, in the Commons this week for uh, describing lateral flow tests as being unreliable. We haven't done that actually. Uh, what we've recognised is that lateral flow tests uh, are worth the money as long as you use them in the right way. <clears throat> they are very good and have been relatively successful in discovering large numbers of people who were asymptomatic are carrying the virus and can com continue to be used in that way. Uh, also, what you've described for Oldham is the process we're using for all care homes in Greater Manchester. It's not just uh, Oldham. <coughs> and the reason for that is that uh, the sensitivity of a PCR test uh, covers a longer period for the period of infection than uh, a lateral flow test uh, uh, does. So uh, if we have a PCR test three days before a visit that uh, is negative then three days later we have a lateral flow test that is positive uh, then the ch chances are that that lateral flow test is very accurate uh, in indeed and if it's following a negative it is unlikely to give a false negative uh, as well because uh, if you've moved from a pcr negative uh, to positive it within three days that is the period when a lateral flow test would be very sensitive in, indeed so uh, again lateral flow tests uh, worth the money uh, well yes uh, as long as you use them for the things that they're designed for and that's what we're doing and andy have you anything to add on testing no that's that's good thank you agree with richard OK, thank you. This is a question then for Andy and then Sir Richard. Uh, this is from Adam Clark at Roch Valley Radio at 218. Uh, Andy, looking at the current data, would you say that it's best for the boroughs in Greater Manchester above the national average to remain in tier three? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, I mean, ultimately, it's a, it's a very it's a close call. I think it's fair. It's fair to say. Uh, and um, the uh, main decision maker, I think, in this case, has to be the the boroughs themselves, rather than uh, than me uh, saying what's right. And I think the boroughs have put their own uh, submissions in into the government, and uh, will uh, have had their own uh, uh, discussions. Um, I I think overall, um, Greater Manchester could sustain a tier two position overall, given the data that's been presented uh, today. But I think there is a range within our boroughs. Uh, and as I say, if the government is erring on the side of caution, um, they may want uh, to take a differential position across the piece. What we're indicating today is that you know that should be an option. It shouldn't be an all or nothing, because you know we need to open the GM economy where we can. Uh, so you know I, I'm not going to get into the business of saying is this borough right for this one, or because obviously it's more than just the. Um, uh, the headline cases, uh, there is the health data to bear, bear in mind and the over 60s data and the trends, etc. Um, so I think there is a case for GM overall, but I think it is more borderline in, in certain boroughs, particularly those, as you say, above uh, the average. 
Um, what we're saying to the government is, you know, please take an evidence-based decision and allow as much of the GM economy to open as possible. I think the uh, important point, Adam, uh, that Andy's made is that we shouldn't look at the uh, number of cases per 100,000 uh, alone. It's looking at all the other data, the, the incidence rate amongst over uh, 60s, what the positivity rate is, uh, what hospital admissions are, how many people we've got in I ICU, bearing in mind that making sure that our hospitals don't fall over is one of the big drivers around uh, the restrictions. And if you take the totality of that, and if you take the direction of travel in the Greater Manchester across the piece is still moving in the right direction, uh, then yes, there is uh, the data says uh, that uh, if it's consistent with the decisions made two weeks ago, uh, that it would be very reasonable for the entirety of Greater Manchester to be in uh, tier two. Uh, that's what the numbers say, and clearly. Uh, uh, districts will have expressed their own view to the Secretary of, uh, of State, but we showed you the numbers, uh, we showed you the overall numbers, we showed you the comparisons with uh, Liverpool and London when the last decisions were made. And if you look at those numbers, you would say if we had those numbers three weeks ago, we would now be in tier two. Thank you, Richard. Um, staying with you, there's a because you mentioned hospitals just then, there's a question from Jen Williams at 2.22 from the Manchester Evening News. Jen writes, I have a question about a piece that was in the Sunday Times at the weekend, which was an insight investigation into the latest phase of the pandemic response. It said that in some GM hospitals, Fairfield is mentioned, for example, we ran out of ICU space. Is this correct to your knowledge? Well, I think, uh, Jen, that the medical director of uh, Fairfield Hospital actually gave a very full rebuttal uh, of that earlier in the week. So uh, to my knowledge, it is very much incorrect. It's certainly not uh, uh, the numbers I was given this morning. I meet the, uh, uh, the uh, lead on intensive care for Greater Manchester every Wednesday uh, morning. And as I stated earlier at the moment, that we do have uh, capacity in uh, intensive care, that the numbers of COVID patients in intensive care have continued to go down, although the rate they're going down has has slowed out. So no, it, it's uh, it's not true. And I think clearly that investigation was uh, uh, flawed, unlike any of your investigations though. Make that clear, Jen. Thank you, Richard. This is a question for Andy and then back with you, Richard. But, but Andy first, this is uh, Josh Andy from The Guardian at 2.21. Uh, Andy, this is a question for you. And this is, uh, have you had conversations, Andy, with government this week around the tiering decision? Uh, have they given you any indication about which tier Greater Manchester will be in? And have you any sense that some boroughs could indeed be moved to tier two, as you suggested, while others staying in three? Uh, that's Andy first and then back to Richard. Um, no, I haven't had conversations uh, with the government this week. Um, as we've said, our boroughs have given indications uh, to the um, uh, to the government. Um, so th those have gone in, and we discussed those uh, last uh, week. There is no indication um, yet uh, coming out of the government, but I think this is true for everywhere. I don't think there is any um, kind of uh, process underway where, whereby people are being uh, notified. Uh, we're certainly not uh, not uh, aware of one. Um, you asked finally any sense that some could be moved well we just keep saying the data says that you know the data here is very different to the data in uh, in london and the southeast and i just want to pick up on the slide josh that richard presented which showed those um uh, positions if you like across the regions um and the very different position with 90 percent increases in east of england and uh and, and london I think what happened was, if you look back to the original tiering decisions, when some of those areas were put in tier two, um, they were still on an upward trend. We were put in tier three on a downward trend. And I think that's a very, you know, makes it a very different position that we were in compared uh, to those other places. And I think what you're beginning to see now is a sort of kind of reversal of what we saw in the summer, where the north of England had high and rising cases and uh, parts of the Midlands, east of England and the southeast 
um, had had much lower cases. That that situation has reversed, and I think what we're both saying today is, you know, because that position is now affecting London, let's not necessarily have a situation where well we've got to be gloomy about everywhere because uh, because you know the p position has changed in London and the southeast. If it's an evidence-based, evidence-led decision. Uh, then we think Greater Manchester, uh, in in large part, if not all, will be or should be uh, in tier three. And we would point to our colleagues in Liverpool who have continued reductions uh, in in tier two. And there is the further consideration that closing all hospitality at this time of year does create more social gatherings in the home. In our view, uh, creates extra pressure on on police forces uh, by doing so. Uh, and we would ask for all of those things to be taken into consideration. Thank you, uh, Richard. I've got nothing to add to that. That covers everything. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, Andy, a question for you uh, at 2.16 from Emma Gill at the Manchester Evening News, Andy. Uh, she writes that the DfE has released attendance figures for schools and for the first time they're broken down by local authority <laughs> area. They show the true extent of absences in Greater Manchester caused by COVID. During two weeks since September, more than 50,000 children were absent from secondaries and primaries. And in the worst hit area, Rochdale, average attendance in secondaries is at 70% and in primaries 84%. Are these figures, Andy, what you expected? And has the rate of cases been acknowledged enough by government, the rate of cases here in Greater Manchester? And do you think it's right, Andy, that mass testing was introduced in London schools first? Well, thank you, uh, Emma, for the question. And to answer the first part, I think the figures are a little higher than we had um, uh, anticipated. So the figure that I've been given was that 12 percent of students um, have been affected by absences. And obviously uh, this would suggest that that is higher and particularly in certain areas that have experienced the highest number of cases. But you are right to raise it because it is a serious issue. Um, we don't believe the government has yet gone far enough with its proposals for uh, exams next year to take account of the large amount of time that a number of students here have spent outside of the classroom. And of course, it's quite a random impact because some will have been sent home multiple times and others, uh, others not at all. And therefore, I believe assessment has to um, be a large part of what, uh, what is done. To say that colleges and universities will give greater consideration to people who've spent some time out of the classroom isn't good enough because they still will carry the stigma of lower grades with them for the rest of their lives. So we welcome the expert group that the um, uh, Secretary of State has set up, but the Greater Manchester COVID Emergency Committee discussed this very issue this week, and we are concerned that what's been said so far does not go enough, go far, far enough to remove the threat of significant discrimination against uh, students in parts of the country where cases have been higher and they've spent more time out of the classroom and we will be putting some uh, proposals into that expert group early in the new year to ensure that that, um, that, that disadvantage is not felt by, uh, by, by students here. I personally believe assessment uh, possibly alongside exams has to be a bigger part of the overall uh, solution here or we are looking at potential unfairness on a fairly uh, widespread scale. On mass testing, uh, Emma, and obviously the government, the government has been working with Greater Manchester on introducing targeted testing at scale, and that has started to begin in earnest um, in, in the last uh, few days, and in certain boroughs, uh, schools will be prioritised uh, as part of that. So I think it, you know, it, the way it was presented was that we we weren't getting any of that support and other places were getting it before us. I think there could have been more done to bring it in here more quickly, given the level of disruption uh, that, that we were that we were facing. Thank you. And Richard, have you anything to add on this? Uh, well, I think two things. Sorry, two, uh, uh, two, two things. Uh, first of all, to uh, reiterate that uh, large scale uh, testing is taking place in Greater Manchester, uh, supported actually in Manchester by the RAF. They, they're here, the, station, the stations are up and, uh, up and running, so, uh, but that allows local choices about where the priorities are. But I think the second thing to say is, is uh, uh, I think uh, over the course of the uh, 
period since September uh, that schools like everybody else have been learning and they're now managing attendance uh, uh, better because of, of what they do. The, the number of children Sorry. being sent home is actually uh, uh, because of COVID it has been reducing over that period of time. But uh, the final thing I'd say is that a fairly comprehensive work is the piece of work that's been done by directors of children's services in uh, in Greater Manchester uh, looking at uh, the impact of COVID-19 on uh, children in relation to schools. This is particularly relevant when we look at local authorities who have been talking about closing schools early uh, in other parts of the country. Uh, the work that Directors of Children's Services has done shows fairly comprehensively that children from a COVID point of view are far safer being in school than they are not being in uh, be, being in school. So uh, clearly, I, th I think that's something we'll take very, very seriously once we go past holidays and we, we start the new, uh, the new term. Uh, being in school reduces the risk for our young people. Thank you, Richard. So uh, staying with you, and we're in the final few health questions here. Uh, two questions that are, are connected. One is from Eloise Linford at uh, Hits Radio and uh, then Rowan Bridge at Five Live. Eloise asks uh, Richard and, and then Andy after. From a health point of view, despite government advice not changing, what's your message, Richard, for people in Greater Manchester thinking of changing their Christmas plans? Uh, how worried are you about the repercussions of mixing households for five days? And then Rowan asks, um, can you tell me if you plan to see your family over Christmas, given that governments have relaxed the rules, even though scientists think it will increase cases? OK, uh, if you take the, the first question, I, actually our messages are up on the screen still. I don't know if you can see the uh, uh, screen, but uh, about keeping safe this Christmas. Yes, we are worried about uh, Christmas. We are worried that they, it could lead to an increase in cases in the new year. Again, something we talked about uh, last week. And the best way of making sure that we don't get that increase in cases comes from how people uh, uh, be, behave uh, and behaving responsibly, behaving safely and following very simple guidelines about what they do and don't need uh, need to do. So uh, yes, worried. Uh, hopefully those messages are clear. Those are the messages we want to be delivering consistently over the next uh, next week and a half. Um, I think I, I love these questions about uh, uh, personalising uh, uh, stuff. Uh, I, am I going to tell people to behave one way and then behave in a different way? The answer is no, I'm not going to do that. Thank you, and Andy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. So, uh, Eloise, on, on your uh, question, um, like like uh, Sir Richard, I'm yes, I am worried. And I said when these plans were first announced um, back in November that I thought it was too much. Um, we're not the kind of family that would stay together for five whole days. I'm not sure. Do many do that? I, I, I always thought it was an odd, uh, odd decision because, you know, a couple of days, maybe three days. But five always felt a little, uh, a little too much um, from from uh, my perspective. Um, I uh, would say to people in Greater Manchester maybe to just listen to what's said today by Sir Richard, by the Prime Minister, and just just have a rethink and, and err on the side of caution. And oh, Rowan, that's the answer to your uh, your question. I think we're going to probably have a discussion at the weekend um, to, to scale uh, scale down, and I guess a lot of families will be uh, will be will be doing that. We are, we're already thinking of quite a modest gathering, but uh, even now, I think we will probably uh, scale it back uh, further still. So um, we certainly wouldn't have been together more than one one day, possibly two. Uh, but uh, even now, we might even think about reducing the numbers. So it's not the Christmas we all would have wanted, um, but you know, we've got to think more than Christmas. We've got to think about uh, what's coming in the new year. And um, just any family needs to think about this. You know, you you would never forgive yourselves um, if something happened in a in a family gathering that you know led to, to to serious illness or worse. So you know, I think we've all just got to, and everybody will be thinking about that. But I do think it's time just to sort of maybe have a pause, reflect before um, before before. Um, actually finalising those Christmas plans. 
Thank you, Andy. And the final health question, which is for you, is from Richard Stead at uh, BBC Radio Manchester, who asks, it's likely that we will get fans back into our football grounds this weekend. That means everybody from Manchester United to Staleybridge Celtic. Have you been speaking to our clubs to make their grounds safe for up to 2,000 fans? Richard, I don't know if you know something that we we don't, but I, I don't think we can yet say it's likely. Um, we're still waiting to to hear the government's uh, decision. It's possible, is what I would I would say. And uh, if they listen to the evidence and the uh, co compelling uh, uh, presentation from from Richard today, then I think uh, we should potentially be seeing that. But it, of course, it will depend upon um, whether or not there is a an all of GM decision or whether or not there's obviously a, 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 a split decision. Um, the boroughs that you mentioned, um, obviously uh, Tameside being the home of Staley Bridge Celtic, T Trafford being the home of Manchester United, both of those uh, are boroughs with, with low numbers of cases, uh, way, way below the national average. So it is possible that we could see, um, uh, we could see uh, fans returning to those uh, grounds and I'm sure both clubs uh, and supporters of both clubs would um, uh, would love for that uh, to happen. So the answer is yes, certainly uh, Greater Manchester Police and Traffic Council, I think, are in touch with uh, Manchester United. And I'm sure uh, it's true that uh, Tameside are in touch with Stalybridge Celtic, although we've not had any direct contact with them uh, ourselves. So everything possible will be done to make uh, ground safe if that is the decision, because we've seen it at other uh, other other grounds that uh, fans have been returned safely and um, you know we would want the same to be the case uh, here and we also want our our football clubs here to have the advantage the competitive advantage that comes with having uh, fans back in the ground particularly where it's safe to do so given the numbers and we believe our numbers will allow it so um, uh, there we are Jimmy though that's um, that will be my answer to that one and I think that probably concludes the health questions and thanks to uh, Sir Richard for, for joining us. Should we move on to the um, second half of today's uh, conference uh, on to uh, policing matters um, to provide a, a general update on some of the uh, uh, policing issues? Uh, and I'll ask Bev to, um, to take us through, through those uh, in a moment, but also to uh, address again the HMIC report and the action that we have uh, put in train immediately uh, to to restore confidence in uh, service provided to victims uh, by Greater Manchester Police. So we will take you through some of those actions. Pleased that uh, Deputy Chief Constable uh, Ian Pilling uh, is with us. Uh, as you may have seen, the Chief Constable is not well this week, but we're delighted that Ian is with us and Ian is uh, leading uh, for uh, Greater Manchester Police on the response to the uh, HMIC report. So uh, we, we have been going into these matters uh, in detail. Of course, of course. the HMIC uh, revealed a picture that is not available to, to us on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis, given the, the detail and the depth with which they looked into, into things. But um, as you will hear today, we have put in, in train uh, a, a significant uh, response to the issues raised. At the same time, though, we, we will point out, and I think uh, the Deputy Mayor will, will, will touch on this, um, the exceptional period that this report um, related to, April to June this year. Uh, and I think there is relevant context that needs to be said about that period, which may um, uh, show, well, does show, we believe, that, um, that the issues raised in that period are not necessarily the issues that will be found on an ongoing basis. But uh, without any further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to, to Bev, who will take you through some general points of update, but also some of the specifics on the HMIC report. Bev. Thank you, Andy, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for, for coming. I thought I'd just touch on some, some general issues that are beginning to arise as we approach the holiday season. Uh, secondly, to say a little bit about the planning that's going into uh, preparations for that period of time. Uh, and then, as uh, the Mayor has said, to, to touch on what we've been doing since we last spoke to you six days ago in relation to the HMIC report. Um, so on, on the kind of 
business as usual scene. I wanted to touch on this really because I think what we're seeing now is an escalation of um, the kind of events, I suppose, that that do un unfortunately um, occur more often at this time of a time of year. Uh, some some really very challenging incidents to police. So over this last weekend just gone, um, we had a couple of um, very serious uh, domestic incidents. Uh, one in Bolton, uh, in which somebody was uh, trying to put petrol in a house and actually doused the police officers with petrol, tried to set them alight, um, didn't manage to do that. The officer uh, did suffer some injury to uh, an eye with petrol getting in. The man was arrested and unfortunately that ended that incident. Um, another one in Rush Home. Uh, uh, on on Tuesday, uh, in, in in which a man um, barricaded himself in a house and threatened to harm the other occupants of the house. Um, very difficult situation to deal with. The house is called. In the end, the police had to force entry, uh, but managed to arrest the man uh, without any harm coming to those other people in there with him uh, and and arrested him. There were some quite big events in terms of um, antisocial behaviour and disorder. One in the south of Manchester in Withenshaw uh, after a funeral uh, on Monday. Uh, numerous reports from the public uh, of concern about what was uh, going to take place. In the end, the funeral um, with a lot of police presence uh, was conducted reasonably well, but there was a major incident afterwards at a, at a public house. Uh, Jessup was called, that's the kind of multi-agency um, uh, pr process. Uh, a major incident was not in the end called, but preparations were laid for that to happen if it was necessary. There was significant police uh, presence and other partners uh, and so on. And, and actually, they all did a great job in very difficult circumstances in that event. Uh, an arson attack on three houses in Partington in which uh, three children were sleeping. Two arrests have been made there and um, people charged with arson with intent to endanger life. A significant antisocial behaviour on Saturday night in Didsbury with gangs of marauding youths uh, going around the town uh, for about five or six hours. I think many, many uh, reports from the public again. And then on sad, uh, sadly on, on Saturday night into, into Sunday morning, searching for a missing young man. Unfortunately, he has drowned in the Bridgewater Canal um, in the city centre uh, in, in um, Saturday night, Sunday morning. And it's very, very sad um, I'm thinking of that, of that family. On the COVID front, house parties are the main issue, gatherings and when the weather permits it, um, out on the street uh, as well. And, and we expect that uh, probably to continue as we go into the holiday season. Looking ahead to that period, um, there's been a lot of planning in case there is a transition to tier two in parts of our uh, region. That will impact mainly on businesses, of course, less so for uh, families. Uh, but also will enable, as Richard raised earlier, um, the playing of football matches with some quite big matches coming up. So, uh, as Andy said, discussions with local authorities and police and the clubs are, are taking place in preparation for that. Detailed plans by GMP and uh, all the local authorities looking ahead for that period. Um, all 10 districts will have a dedicated response team of a COVID car, as we call it, from the police and local authority support during the week with that doubled up uh, for every weekend. And in addition, uh, at the weekends, two police support units, that's 42 officers, um, on hand to be deployed in local areas uh, where, where, where the, there's a call for that. There'll be a goal command structure all over uh, that holiday and the city centre will have a joint local authority Greater Manchester Police team with its own uh, silver command structure. So those arrangements are in place. We expect that period uh, to, to be really challenging. So moving on now to what we've been doing over the last six days in relation to the HMI C report and we've made uh, further progress. I talked last week about the detailed action plan that the Deputy Chief Constable and his team had already given me that uh, has been uh, refined and we're working through that, but we're also taking some immediate steps that we think uh, you know, will be really helpful in the short term uh, to give momentum to this to this process. 
I think, as Andy said, though, it's worth setting out just so it is completely understood and this isn't at all to detract from the seriousness with which we regard these issues. Um, that, that isn't the case. But it's worth setting out some of the contextual issues that were around then. Um, the inspectors, although they analysed their data later in the year, they, they actually took all the incidents and cases um, that they were going to analyse from the period April to June 2020. And that period was very, very difficult um, for everybody, but including GMP. Uh, you know, they, they had recently introduced COVID legislation to respond to, and that meant thinking about interpretation, implementation, training right across the whole of the organisation. A significant impact itself in the capacity of GMP by people being ill and having uh, to self-isolate. Reduced capacity, particularly in the newly centralised crime recording and resolution unit, which I'll speak about in a little while. And at the same time as all of that impacting on capacity and capability, um, significantly increased demand, as we've been talking about every week here, in response to COVID-19 legislation, calls from the public, um, and actually also to say that the police played a significant part, along with all our partners, in supporting the overall Greater Manchester response to the pandem pandemic. Um, and as you'll remember, throughout the summer, I, I have been saying uh, uh, to what extent there was the cancellation of office arrest days, officer, uh, ho uh, officer holidays and officers having to be brought in on, uh, on overtime. So uh, a very, very difficult um, situation uh, to deal with. And I just wanted that to be recognised because I don't think we did make those points uh, last week and, and I want it to be understood. In terms of the action we're taking, I'll hand back to the mayor uh, in, a, in a moment that there are four, I think, specific things in addition to moving ahead with the action plan. Um, one is I've been, my office has been talking to the inspectorate um, themselves and the inspector responsible for the report is, is very keen to support uh, the progress that we want to make and to do what she can um, to help in, in practical ways. So the mayor and I are going to meet with her before the end of this week uh, to flesh out our plans in detail and to talk to her how she can support the effort that's being made. Secondly, I've mentioned the Central Recording and Resolution Unit. This was part of the very significant changes that the police were bringing in to address this issue. It, it, it got suspended uh, during the pandemic. It was established earlier on in the year uh, and there were plans to recruit more staff to it. That recruitment had to also um, be, be suspended. Um, that recruitment has now restarted. It actually restarted before the HMIC report was published. And the unit has already demonstrated improvements in the areas of crime recording that it's been dealing with. The first phase of incidents that have been going into this central unit uh, with a compliance rate of 98%. So as I said last week, we're clear that this is um, a positive improvement. It will make a big difference. And we're accelerating now um, the speed with which that unit can be stood up to deal with all incidents right across Greater Manchester. Um, and thirdly, obviously, the police, uh, the police have established a goal structure to deal with the implementation uh, of the changes that are necessary. There will be a small, uh, very experienced task force behind that and embedded in that task force will be a member of my team and also a member seconded from the combined authorities um, internal audit team. And uh, with that group, uh, we will be reviewing progress on a weekly basis and reporting to the mayor every month. I think I said that last time. So I'll stop there, uh, Andy, and hand back to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Bev. And just to then pick up some of the, um, the, the further points that uh, Bev uh, touched on. Obviously, police numbers and uh, staff resources is a, is a crucial part of getting this uh, whole uh, question right. And what I wanted to say today is that the recruitment that we began, uh, the Deputy Mayor and I, when we when we came into office and the, 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 the end of the erosion of the front line, which we, which we put in place, we 
We'll be talking to other leaders across Greater Manchester, but we'll be wanting to build on the progress that's been made uh, in the next uh, financial year uh, and add to the 679 additional officers now in place in Greater Manchester as a result of the recruitment that we've done over the last uh, few years. So when we came into office, the force was 2,000 frontline officers down. Because of the recruitment that we've uh, put in uh, place, uh, working with um, the Chief Constable and the, De and the Deputy Chief Constable, we have now obviously reduced that deficit to uh, 1,300 or so, down on what we were, if you go back to 2010. But it's important to say that that is still a massive um, uh, kind of reduction in the capacity of Greater Manchester Police, and we need to continue to repair the, the damage that was done uh, to police numbers in that in that period. Um, as Bev said, we have just agreed to accelerate recruitment to the um, uh, to the uh, the uh, crime reporting central recording and resolution uh, unit, um, and um, 34 staff are currently being recruited to posts within that unit, and we are uh, speeding up all of our plans in that regard, uh, as well as boosting police numbers uh, overall. And we'll have more to say that early about, about that early in the new year. The final thing I wanted to say is a specific action arising from um, from the report is something that that I have asked uh, to be put in place uh, to support victims of crime in Greater Manchester because. Until we've got all of the internal actions in place, of course, we can't yet be fully confident that every victim of crime is getting the service that, that we would want them to have. And that is why I have asked uh, for a, a new hotline to be stood up, uh, which will be provided by our partners, Victim Support. And this will be operational from early next week, and we'll be able to give you the phone number then, and we'll be able to uh, signpost the public towards it then. This is um, not to report crime, so we would say to the public, uh, they must go through the usual channels to, to report uh, crime uh, the, in, the, in the normal way. But this is a specific service for anybody in Greater Manchester who feels that their crime hasn't been uh, properly recorded and they haven't been uh, supported in, in making their uh, report. And it's a, a, an alternative route for people to go to if they feel the service has not been uh, what, it, uh, what it should uh, have been. And what we will do is ensure that a senior GMP officer uh, will be in place to review um, the uh, complaints coming in via uh, that uh, service. And that will feed into our overall audit of, of what we're doing to get uh, the support for uh, for victims' rights. So that is a new service that I've decided to stand up to support victims of crime uh, and it will take immediate effect. So it will be there in place to support people uh, over the um, over the holiday uh, period. Uh, and we will provide full details of that early next week. And I would just um, say to people too, there is the new online service, Single Online Home, which uh, has been stood up by Greater Manchester Police. That too uh, can provide a route for people to make a complaint if they feel uh, their their crime has not been uh, handled uh, properly. And we would we'll be encouraging people to use that too if they would prefer uh, to use uh, to use that um, uh, that route. So, uh, what I would say in conclusion is obviously these are serious issues, and they've been identified over a number of years. And the Deputy Mayor and I take them extremely seriously and we are in touch uh, with government ministers uh, to ensure uh, that um, the plans that we're putting in place have have their support uh, too to ensure that the the response is as it should be that said we are now clear that the pandemic did uh, have an impact at this particular point in time both in uh, disrupting the recruitment plans to the central um, uh, recording and resolution uh, unit, but also in terms of the number of staff uh, who, who uh, were taken away from normal duties towards COVID uh, legislation, or indeed who were self-isolating and shielding uh, earlier this year. And there was a point in time where we were concerned about those numbers because they did get very high uh, at, at one point. And that of course will have had an impact, impact on the service that could be provided. 
But while that context does need to be borne in mind, um, it, it is not to, to say that there aren't serious issues here that need to be addressed. And what we've said today on the issues that Bev has outlined um, and that I've just uh, reinforced, uh, we think what, what is emerging here is a, a plan that has the required urgency and seriousness uh, to address uh, the issues in a, in a way that will restore confidence uh, and restore the, the right service to victims of crime across Greater Manchester. Before we open up to your questions, I'm now just going to give the floor to the Deputy Chief Constable, Ian Pilling, who might want to add to, uh, to what I or what Bev has said. Ian. Yeah, thanks, Andy, and thank you for the invitation to um, take part today. Just to go back to some of the things that, that the Deputy Mayor outlined around some of the incidents over the weekend, which was incredibly busy. I just want to pay tribute to the very brave police officers, particularly at the incident where the petrol was thrown. I'm sure a lot of media colleagues will have seen some of the horrific video that we were able to, to, to put out, you know, extremely brave work. And I want to pay tribute to all the officers and, and, and staff across across GMP for all, all the, the, the great work during the course of, of this year. Um, as, as the Deputy Mayor said, we're preparing sort of dual plans for the next couple of weeks, you know, one for remaining in tier three, one for going to tier two, and obviously we can adapt between the, the two, um, depending on what the decision is, will potentially bring us some slightly different policing challenges. But we've got plans in place, uh, whatever that decision is, to be able to respond effectively right over the, the Christmas period. Um, just to add one thing to, to that, the Deputy Mayor said over the last few days, we've had um, a number of significant serious road traffic accidents, unfortunately not uncommon at this time of year. And I would just please ask if the message can be put out through through the colleagues and the media, just to urge caution, please, on our roads at, at, at this time of year. And the other message, please, if I can, I'd like to put out it, it is just an appeal for, for people, please, to comply with the COVID rules um, over the Christmas period. It will be a very demanding period for policing. And if I don't have to put as much resource into going to calls where the, the, the rules are being breached, that means I can deploy those resources elsewhere where they're much more um, effective and able to look after our communities. So, so that's just some general issues. Just. On the report, um, I think everything's been said um, by yourself, um, the Mayor and, and, and Deputy Mayor. Clearly, we treat this report very seriously. That's the first thing I would want to, to say. And the second thing is that, you know, where we have let a victim down, I want to apologise to them. I think that, that's important as well. We have been sort of making these improvements since May of this year, um, and, and we can show a steady trajectory of improvement since that time. I think what the report has illustrated is we need to make those improvements even quicker and we need to be even more robust in our governance and oversight and that is what we will be over the coming weeks and months. We've had long-term plans in place for a number of months um, around the centralised crime recording. It's probably worth just explaining very briefly around that. What that means is the traditional way of recording crime is, is a victim rings the police, we send somebody around and the officer makes sort of completes the crime report and submits it when, when either at the scene or when they get back to the police station. The, the way that we are trying to implement now and, and which we're some way towards doing is that when the victim actually rings GMP, the person they speak to on the phone or somebody they will uh, speak to just after their initial call, We'll do that recording of the crime over the telephone before the officer actually arrives at the scene and what that means we can be assured that our crime recording is up to standard. As you've said, um, we tried to introduce that, I started to bring that in from February of this year. It was disrupted because of the COVID pandemic. We couldn't recruit the extra staff that were needed, but we're now back on track to be able to do that. So that's what's going to be happening over the next few weeks and months. But we've got plans in the meantime because clearly we can't wait for that to happen. We need to be sure now that any victim of crime, you know, that does report a crime to GMP, that that crime is recorded accurately and properly. And we've got a parallel process in place to make sure um, that that's the case. And I just want to you know, reflect on, on some of the positives from the report. You know, we are giving a really good service to, to victims of, 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 of rape, uh, victims of sex offences. Um, you know, that the, the crimes that are being recorded into the central unit are being recorded to a very high standard. And what I would like to say is that should give the public the confidence to see that we can do this, we, we can achieve this, we've done it for other crime types. What we need to do now is complete the job and, and get all crime recorded in this way and give the best possible service to victims. And I'll give that assurance and I can give that assurance rather that that is the top of our priorities and we are well on with, with the plan. Thanks Andy. 
Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Ian, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, Jimmy, I will hand back to you to take uh, us through any uh, questions from colleagues in the media. Thank you, Andy. We have only a couple of, of policing questions, so if colleagues have more, now is your time to submit them. But we can start, Andy, with a question for you from Michael Gaffney at Heart and Smooth. Michael writes, please can you tell us how the Chief Constable being on sick leave might affect plans to address the findings of the HMIC report? Should he be unavailable for a long period of time, who is going to set GMP's strategic direction and ultimately be accountable for their improvement? So uh, it, to answer the question directly, uh, Michael, um, it, it isn't going to affect uh, the plans because you, you will have seen that uh, we are getting on with the implementation of a, a whole series of, of actions. But I think as the Chief Constable has, um, has, has made clear, he is in touch with, with colleagues in the, uh, in the command uh, team, despite being uh, off, uh, off work sick this, um, this, this week. So I don't think there's, uh, I don't think there is any suggestion actually that it's going to be a long uh, period of, of time. So, um, obviously we'd probably review things in the, in the new year and, uh, uh, and take stock then, but, um, uh, I don't think it is going to affect the plan. We've got a clear plan as you've heard today. Uh, there's the right level of scrutiny uh, behind it. There's confidence in the actions we've had in, indication from the HMIC that they think we're responding in the right way, but we will try and confirm that with the um, the Chief Inspector uh, on on Friday. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the plan will be implemented and uh, we will ensure uh, that the improvement um, is is made. And, um, you know, ultimately I will be accountable for, for that to ensure that uh, the public of Greater Manchester get the service that they that they they require, and that is why I've um, set up the hotline today because I I don't want it to be just a case of we're doing internal actions and still the service isn't good enough to the public. If people aren't getting the right service, I would ask them to use this new hotline provided by Victim Support um, to 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 raise any concerns or any complaints. Uh, and we will be monitoring that carefully and we will ensure that that service can pick up any uh, issues that do not get dealt with properly before all of the internal improvements are, are made. So I hope you can see in that, Michael, that um, uh, we are acting swiftly uh, on the findings of the report uh, and um, I am confident it will lead to the improvements that we all want to see. Thank you, Andy. The next question is for Bev, uh, although Andy, you may wish to comment uh, after Bev. And this is from Claire Fallon at Channel 4 News. Uh, Bev Claire writes, nationally and in Greater Manchester, figures have been published showing that crime was significantly down during the period of the time of the inspection, including the kinds of crime highlighted as particular areas of concern by the inspection report. Can you explain exactly what it is about the timing and the context that you believe mitigates the criticisms in the report as crime levels were down then? You've mentioned staffing levels being affected in that period. Do you have any figures for the numbers or the percentages to give us an idea of the scale of the impact on GM staffing at that time? OK, thank you, Claire. Um, in fact, not all types of crime um, did fall. A volume crime, robbery, burglary, um, public disorder crime uh, did fall. Actually, domestic abuse, which is one of the uh, crimes highlighted in the report, uh, did not fall um, at all. Similarly, there were other uh, road traffic um, offences, particularly speeding, um, that increased and the police had to put in place a special operation to try and uh, respond to that. So it was a, a mixed picture in, in terms of what the uh, th what impact the COVID pandemic had on, on crime. But yes, there were substantial, uh, substantial falls at the same time, though, as I said, and, and, and I might say it's not this is not to mitigate the findings. This is just to provide some context to understand what was happening in that period in terms of the, 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 the demands on the police as well as the impact on their on their capacity. Um, and the additional demands that came from COVID were very substantial, actually, during that period. It wasn't so much policing um, 
non-compliance as it has been since we were we were in lockdown but the support that the police gave to the overall effort was very very substantial for instance they they stood up and put in place and built and staffed a mortuary facility in Trafford Park worked with the coroners um, that that took quite a lot of um, of, uh, of resource and, and was ongoing for some time um, equally, the PPE situation um, that the police supported, as well as the humanitarian work going on to to get um, to, to get food and parcels and so on to uh, people who were shielding. So there was substantial effort uh, around supporting the whole um, plan uh, uh, and our, our detailed response as a Greater Manchester set of partners to, to, to what was happening. In terms of the impact on staffing levels of the COVID uh, virus itself, the, the um, absence due to self-isolation or to, to illness, that varied in, in different parts of the organisation, uh, but in some parts it was substantial, as much as 30% at times. But I think if I, uh, Andy, could bring in Ian Pilling in here, he would be able to give some accurate figures on 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 the impact of the COVID itself on staffing. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just waiting for the uh, thing to kick in. The yes. Ab ab absolutely. Um, as, as, as the deputy mayor said, you know, the impact has, has, has varied during the period. Um, I, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but, but Bev's quite right. It was up to 30 percent in some departments at some times. What that meant was we had to actually move staff around the organisation. So, you know, people were doing different roles to be able to backfill. Um, we were particularly um, hit within the storeroom environments and what we were able to do there very quickly was have staff answering one on one calls um, at home, which no other force to our knowledge has been able to do that. And we're able to do that very quickly because of, of our, our technology. So it, it did impact the organisation. I said it, it impacted different departments in different ways. You know, we get an outbreak in one particular location, which would cause significant issues. And, and then those staff would come back into work and then we get another outbreak somewhere else. So we were constantly moving staff um, around. Again, you know, we've seen a recent sort of um, surge in, in, in recent weeks with, again, our sickness pushing 10% a few weeks ago. That is now way back down again to around sort of the 3% level, so, so much improved. Um, but I think the challenge has been, you know, the fact that it's, it's varied so much, it's gone up and down so much, it's been in different parts of the force, and it's been a real challenge to move people around to be able to, uh, to fill those gaps. Thank you, Ian. Andy, have you anything to add at this stage? Uh, you're currently muted as well, Andy, just so you know. Um, a question then um, back to Ian, if that's possible, uh, and then on to Bev. This is from Joshy Herman at the Mill, Ian. Uh, is the new mechanism for crime reporting, the one that you described earlier, what was being tested when Greater Manchester Police suffered a major data breach a few months ago involving an external contractor? And then a question for Bev related. You told us a couple of months ago that you'd written to the Chief Constable about the data breach. Have you got any update? But in first and then Beth. I can't think of any links between the two. Um, clearly, you know, we have one overarching system of uh, IT system. Um, but as far as I'm aware, that the, there wasn't a connection. Um, that, that, that was a different part of the system. What we're talking about here is, is the actual crime recording system, which is, um, you know, up, up and running. What we're trying to do is centralise that rather than bring in um, a, a new system per se. But as I say, I, I, I don't think there's a connection. I certainly can't think of what one might be. Thank you, Ian and Bev. Yeah, thank you, Jossie. Uh, yes, I, I did have a, a full response from the Chief Constable. Um, there was an internal uh, in investigation um, by GMP, obviously in conjunction with the contractor. Uh, it was clarified what exactly happened it really was uh, human error on, on the part of one of their employees and action was taken uh, by the contractor in relation to that employee. Obviously, as well as that internal investigation, the matter has been refer referred to the Information Commissioner and uh, we are awaiting the Information Commissioner's uh, report on his, his investigation. That's not yet arrived. 
Thank you, Bev. And so two questions for Andy. The first is from uh, Jen Williams at 308. Andy from the Manchester Evening News. Jen asks, Kit Malthouse said last week that he was seeking an urgent meeting with you about the HMIC report. I wondered whether this meeting had happened yet. And if so, what was said by the government? Uh, Jen, I'm I'm going to do the typical politician trick here and uh, sort of uh, do a sideways pass. But I, I, the meeting has taken place. Um, but it was attended by uh, the deputy mayor. So I think it's probably uh, right that I uh, hand over to, to Bev to answer that question. Yeah, thanks, John. Yes, I met Kit Moss House, uh, obviously virtually, um, yesterday, along with the deputy chief constable. Um, it was a very constructive meeting. I mean, clearly he said he was very disappointed, um, but that reflects how I feel as well. So. Um, there was a meeting of minds there and we outlined for him uh, what we were going to do, the immediate steps we're taking, including those that we've reported on today, um, but, but also the, the wider um, action in the, in the action plan and the goal structure and the task force that will be in place uh, to make sure that's implemented. I offered to, to give him regular uh, reports through his officials. Um, and that will happen. And he offered any help and support um, that he could give. And we're going to give some consideration to what we might be able to ask for in terms of um, it'll be support of the nature of a kind of a peer support or expertise. Um, uh, and if we need to call on that, you know, we will. Thank you, Bev. And so uh, a question for Andy uh, again at 310. This is from Hannah Miller at Granada, Andy. When did you last speak to the Chief Constable and how would you describe the tone of that conversation? So I, I was due to, to meet the Chief Constable this uh, week, Hannah, but um, uh, obviously he's not well this week. Um, and uh, before that, it was last week, as I explained at the uh, press briefing last week, we had a, a conversation, myself, the Deputy Mayor, with uh, both the Chief Constable and uh, the Deputy Chief Constable, um, uh, Ian, who's on the, the call today, uh, about the findings from the HMIC. And it was a, essentially a, well, a, an exchange, a frank exchange, if you like, just understanding, going through uh, where GMP were, what the inspector was saying. And so uh, it was very much, if you like, exploratory, uh, getting to the bottom of, uh, of what, uh, what was being presented uh, to us. Um, so uh, I haven't uh, obviously uh, had a conversation uh, this week uh, with the Chief Constable, but I will as soon as, as he returns to work. Thank you, Andy. And this is the final question, and it's for Ian first, and then back to Andy, if you'd like to conclude, Andy. Uh, Ian, this is from Richard Stead at Radio Manchester, who asks, if we move into Tier 2, how concerned are you about policing football grounds? It's United versus Leeds on Sunday, City versus Newcastle on Boxing Day, even Altrincham versus Stockport on Boxing Day. All have got potential for public disorder and issues with social distancing on trams, etc. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. Um, clearly, it is something that we've been looking at for, for quite a while. We are very experienced in Greater Manchester at policing football matches, albeit clearly not in the case of policing them under COVID regulations. Um, you know, ultimately, whether the game goes ahead or not is a matter for the, the safety advisory group. And, and if that approval is given, then we will speak to the club. We'll look at uh, the kickoff times, the transport networks, um, you know, where we need to focus our, our resources. This, this is new to us. It's new to us all. But I can give the assurance, uh, A, that we are speaking to the clubs and working with them, and B, that whichever games, if any games go ahead, then there'll be an appropriate policing response and appropriate um, resources will be in place to deal with, with whatever, whatever comes up. Thank you, Ian. And Bev wanted to speak, and, and then Andy. Thanks. I just wanted really uh, not particularly on on this question, um, but thinking about everything that that we've talked about today um, to say that, you know, although our primary concern is the the impact on public confidence of the HMIC report, um, I'm equally concerned about the confidence of our police officers and our police staff. Um, we've rehearsed today uh, some of the very, very difficult situations that they go out to day in 
day out. These are citizens of Greater Manchester trying to keep the rest of us uh, safe and they do so willingly and with great courage and I just think you know I, I want to um, remind us all of that and as we go into what will be another challenging season um, to thank them uh, for what they're doing and to recognise that you know when we're having whatever Christmas we have and it won't be the same many of those as with our other emergency services and our NHS staff uh, we will be out working, including on Christmas Day. Thanks. Thanks, Bev, uh, and thank you everybody for your, your questions this afternoon. And obviously we'll continue to uh, update you all on the progress that we're making. But as you can see, uh, I have uh, uh, immediately worked with the Deputy Mayor to put in place a series of, um, of actions uh, that will begin the process of um, repairing uh, the confidence that was uh, was damaged by the report last week. There's no point in uh, shying away from that. We've not shied away from anything, actually. We've faced up to it immediately um, and we are putting, uh, putting things uh, right. And I, I'm very pleased that we've been able to stand up that new service for uh, victims of crimes so quickly and grateful to everyone who's been, been involved in that. I think it is worth saying that the pandemic clearly has uh, uh, distracted Greater Manchester Police this year, as it has all public services, and allowances do need to be made uh, for that. But to echo what Bev just said, you know, let's remember that uh, Greater Manchester Police officers and staff have been providing incredible service to the public uh, this year in very difficult uh, circumstances, and we do all owe them. Uh, a, a real debt of, of thanks. It's been a hard year for everybody, but often it's been the police on the very front line implementing new legislation of, you know, damned if they do, damned if they don't. If they don't go to a uh, what's called a child's birthday party and disrupt it, then um, they would be criticised. If they do go and uh, challenge it, then they're criticised. You know, I think it's been a hard year for for uh, for people on the front line of our of our police service, and we want, would want to say to them today that we we recognise that we thank them uh, for what they've been doing, often dealing really carefully and sensitively with with difficult uh, situations, uh, and we want a, a police force that supports them in every way possible, including with the internal systems to improve their service to, to the Greater Manchester public. So we are confident that in just a, a small number of days, uh, significant uh, progress uh, has been made. As I've said before, I will be uh, ultimately accountable for, for putting this right. And I will, working with the Deputy Mayor, uh, put this, uh, put this uh, right. But we are already confident that there is an improvement from uh, the period that was inspected uh, by the um, by, by the the chief inspector. So we will keep you posted on this uh, on this important uh, issue. Thank you again, everybody, uh, for your questions. And I think we will see you for one final briefing uh, next week. Thanks, everybody, and thank you to you, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you, Bev, and thank you, Ian. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much for that.